if we weren't having a baby dedication, I'd just say, amen, let's go home, because <laughs> that's the high point of the service right there. Uh, my soul. We're going to be in Psalm 127 this morning, Psalm 127. At the end of this service, I'm going to tell the moms and dads when y'all get to go, and y'all will go, and we're going to have a baby dedication. We've got so many that we literally have to do it twice a year now. So uh, this is group number one. I guess the next one will come in the fall. Uh, some announcements while you're turning in your Bible to Psalm 127. First of all, don't forget baptism. We're having baptism next week, next Sunday. Uh, if you are a candidate for baptism, if you've been saved, you've given your heart to Christ, and have never been scripturally baptized, uh, you may consider this. Uh, the Bible says it's one of the first acts of obedience for a believer. So I would hope and pray that you would uh, take that very seriously. Got a lot of folks to baptize. Also, I want to ask you to pray for some folks. Please be in prayer for our mission team, uh, Billy and uh, Jim Muckleroy and several others are down in Belize right now where we sponsor a Bible college. Brother Bob Farley has a, has a mission station there and we just uh, pour ourselves into it. So we need to be in prayer for our uh, mission team that is in Belize and they are under great spiritual attack and we want to lift them up in our prayers. Also be in prayer for uh, Brother Mike Hendricks, he is a faithful member of our church that was in an accident, very bad accident up in the Dallas area. He's at Parkland right now. He's, he's, he's being stabilized, but uh, we need to lift him up in our prayers and just really pray for Mike and Miss um, Erlene. Uh, we are putting together a church business directory. Very excited about that. So that if you're a church member, you can say, okay, I need a plumber. Is there a plumber in my church? And and, and you can find that number or, you know, so whatever business you represent or if you would like it to be in that directory, we'd invite you to be a part of that. You can fill out, there's a little uh, piece of paper in the slot. I don't know what we're going to start calling it, the slot. Uh, or you can go out to the foyer after the service, uh, and there's a gentleman by the name of Mark Schlitt that is there. Uh, he represents this company, and he can answer all your questions. And, and I hope you'll go by and say, hey, uh, we'd like our name in the directory, and that'll be good. Tonight, we've got youth-led services. I'm excited about that. This is our church of tomorrow. We want to certainly encourage them and be back tonight at 6 o'clock to make our Lord's Day complete. So what we're going to do is uh, go through the sermon. At the end of the sermon, I'm going to let the moms and dads that are dedicating babies go at the right time, don't get up and leave on me yet, okay? So we're going we're gonna to get to the front of the line. No, you're not. You're going to stay here until I tell you you can go. <laughs> and then, I, I promise you, I'm going to give you plenty of time, and we're going to have a good time of recognizing these precious babies. I did want to show you all one thing. I went to the Philippines, and we, uh, you know, sat down and said, okay, what are some of the things that we can help you guys with? And one of them was they said, we need a people mover something uh, to go to the mission that we help out in the mountains and through the kind donations of Flint Baptist Church this is what they were able to buy and I said how many yeah I said how many people can you get in there he said well we can get three in the front and there's a bench on the right side we can get 12 on that seat and we can get 12 on the other seat and then 10 in the middle and uh, so we can get 40 in it. <laughs> I said, my, so, and he put it on the end, he said, if they're not too heavy. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know if 40 of us could fit in that, but uh, 40 of them can. But we appreciate that and, and just so many wonderful things that are going on on the mission stations that we're helping out with. So we're at Psalm 127. If you would please stand in honor of God's word. Great crowd. Appreciate y'all being here. Uh, very familiar passage of scripture about the family except the Lord build the house they labor in vain that build it except the Lord keep the city the watchman waketh but in vain it is vain for you to rise up early and to sit up late and eat the bread of sorrows for so he giveth his beloved sleep lo children are an heritage of the Lord the fruit of the womb is his reward 
As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Father, thank you so very much for the message you've laid on my heart. God, I right now just want to really lift up our, our mission team in Belize. I thank you, God, that they were able to safely get to Punta Gorda and to the uh, mission station. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would keep them safe. God, that you would rebuke the wicked one. And God, that our church family could just bathe them in prayer. I also lift up Brother Mike and Miss Erlene and God, their family. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would heal my friend. God, that you would uh, just give the doctors great wisdom as they deal with him. And Lord, I am so, so grateful that that uh, police officer knew what to do when he got to Mike in that truck. Please, God, hear our praise today. May our response be overwhelming, for it's in Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Our families are under attack. But that's nothing new because they have been under attack for centuries and centuries. From wicked kings that promote immorality to wicked kingdoms that try to separate families and break down the nuclear family. This is not unusual because Satan loves to destroy what God has created. There are organizations today that advocate the killing of babies inside and outside the womb. How wicked is that? I'm not talking about on other continents. I'm talking about in the United States of America. Every time a wicked king would get on the throne in the Old Testament, you would find that he would oftentimes have their their children to walk through the fire or they would sacrifice them to that wicked God called Molech. We're following in their footsteps. There are organizations that advocate the redefining of what a family is, that it's no longer a mother and a father and children, but instead it's two fathers or two mothers or three or four or five no-fault divorce race, rate, rates are skyrocketing inside and outside the church. Today, if a person comes to my office and says, we want to get married, I have to tell them, you got a 50-50 shot. 50% chance of getting a divorce somewhere down the road that this will fail. I don't know about you, but if I went to the East Texas Fair and I was about to get on the Ferris wheel and they said, listen, you got a 50-50 shot of your cart falling off. Brother, I really want to examine the card I got into, amen? I want you to understand this is not just a physical attack, but it's a spiritual attack that is manifested in physical means. You got an enemy. The devil would love to tear your family up. He'd love for there to be unforgiveness and hatred and bitterness in your heart. He would love for you to have World War III break out when you go home. He loves when you fight on the way to church. He, he loves when, when you go to bed angry and you let the sun go down on your wrath. He loves dads when you blow your stack and attack those children's mother. So the question is, why does the devil care about my family or the health of my marriage or how I raise my children? Simply because marriage and family are the invention of God. Man didn't create this. We don't have enough sense to create something good like that. God created marriage. It was God that said, I will make for man a help meet. It's not good for man to be alone. I'm going to make a help meet for him. I'm going to make a partner for him. And, 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 and then I'm going to get them where they can have children. God invented that. It didn't just happen. I, I can't believe there's some ignoramuses that are so dumb that they would teach that that, that, that the ability to have a child just happened. <clears throat> See, here's the thing. God invented marriage, and when it works, he gets glory. When two believers live in a home together, and they love each other, and they teach the word, and they teach the, the love for Jesus, and, and, and there's peace, and there's harmony, it doesn't mean there's a perfect home, but when there's a good home between two believers, and, and, and they share that love for Jesus with their children, God is glorified. 
But when you have two Christians in the home that are fighting like cats and dogs, that are holding grudges and that are angry and injuring each other over and over and over again, then God loses glory and Satan laughs at the invention that God made. Satan loves to try to rob God of his glory. John 10.10 10 says, The thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus said, But I am come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. So what we're going to look at today is this song of degrees. And, and it's called degrees because it, through uh, Psalm 120 through 134, there are 15 psalms. And it's believed one of two things. One, there were 15 steps that would go up to the court of the women inside the, the temple at Jerusalem. And it was like if you got on step one, you would say Psalm 120. And then you go to the next step, you go Psalm 121. And you would quote the psalms as you went up the steps. Others believe that they were written because when you were far way off coming to celebrate like the Passover or you were coming to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem, you, as you were getting closer, you would begin to quote those psalms. And, and it makes a lot of sense because it's like you're getting closer and closer to being able to worship God. It's really good. But Psalm 127 points us toward the family. And I believe that it talks about the presence of the Lord. Let me show you my outline. The presence of of the Lord, the protection of the Lord, and the presence, as in gifts of the Lord. So we begin by looking at the presence, the, 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 the unseen presence of God in our home, where the Bible says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain to build it. Now understand something, it's not talking about the stick structure that you live in. It's talking about your family. The house of DeVille, the house of Jones, the house of Smith. It's the house that you're building of you and you, how you deal with your parents and how you deal with your children and your grandchildren. That's your house. That's the house that bears your name. When Karen and I got married, we had a choice. Uh, we said, well, we can either do this on our own or we're going to seek God's wisdom and advice. When I marry young couples today, I say, listen, I'm going to tell you something. You're not children anymore. You're adults. Nobody's going to come peeping in your window. You've got to make decisions. You've got to decide whether you're going to recognize the unseen presence of God in your home. Nobody's going to come and look and say, are you praying? You're not supposed to watch that on the TV. Don't drink that. Don't smoke that. Don't do that. Don't. Don't use those ugly words. You're the adult now. You've got to make the choice. It's your decision what vocabulary you'll use inside your home. It's your decision what you watch on the television. It's your decision what you have brought inside your home and what's outside your home. We decided we were going to seek the Lord's guidance. Because in the New Testament, Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And we were just dumb enough to believe him. So we sought his guidance on our occupation. We didn't just take any job for a paycheck. We believed that God, as our Heavenly Father, had a desire for us to be in a certain occupation. He led us in our occupation. He led us in our physical location. I'll be honest with you, I would have never picked Flint. I didn't even know where Flint was. The pulpit committee called me and said, we're from Flint Baptist Church. and we, I said, Flint where? They said, well, Flint, Texas. I said, I've never heard of it. They said, it's right outside of Tyler. I said, no, 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 it is not. I was raised in Tyler. <laughs> I got here and I figured out why I didn't know where it was here. <laughs> we didn't even have a gas station at that time. Didn't have a Dollar General, had a post office. That was it, brother. We sought the Lord's guidance and he led us here. Best decision we ever made. We sought the Lord's guidance on our education and how we educated our children. We sought the Lord's guidance on our recreation, the things that, 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 that we would uh, do for fun. We sought the Lord's guidance in our participation. In any club or activity, we sought the Lord's guidance. We said, God, is this a good thing or is this a bad thing? We prayed Luke 11, 11. Y'all know what that is. That's where the Bible says uh, your Heavenly Father loves you. If you would ask for him a fish, would he give you a serpent? If you would ask for him a piece of bread, would he give you a stone? So we would pray and we say, God, I don't know. Is this a bread or a piece of stone? If it's a stone, keep it away from us. But if it's bread, we like bread. Give us bread. 
If it's a serpent, keep it away, but go, God. If it's a fish, we like fish too. Give us the fish. And God guided us and led us in what our activities were and what our location was, our education. And we've tried to apply God's wisdom to every area of our home and marriage from raising our children to conflict resolution. And I want you to know something, my dear friend. I'm not standing up here to say, oh, my family is just wonderful. We never make a mistake. I, Karen's not who you think she is. <laughs> no, 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 I'm kidding. <laughs> it's me. I'm the bad one, not her. <laughs> but, brother, I need all the help I can get. Amen. Those babies came out. I looked at them. They didn't have any instructions on them. I need help. I need the Bible. I need God to show me what to do. Listen to me carefully. Except you include the Lord in your family and recognize his unseen presence in his home to seek his favor in prayer, to share his wisdom in the word, to make the Lord's day a day of worship, then our efforts are in vain. There are homes that are challenging, sometimes very frustrating. I wish I had all the answers as to why in one home you could have one great kid and one that's mean as the devil. I don't understand all those things. I don't understand why you can lead some horses to water and some will drink and some won't. But I'm going to give you this. I'm going to give them every opportunity in the world to drink the water. Amen. I'm going to put them in the position where they get to meet godly people, where they get to have godly influences on them. I'm going to have them in Sunday school. I'm going to have them in church. I'm going to have them in RAs. I'm going to have them in in the, the youth program. Well, the teacher's just not perfect. Good. He needs to suffer a little bit. Amen. That's why we need the Lord to give us wisdom and stability because he brings our chaos back into order. And brothers, some homes are in chaos. Very seldom a week goes by that somebody doesn't call me out of this congregation and say, we're calling it quits. That's it. We're done. He's leaving. She's leaving. We need the presence of the Lord. It's, it's not enough just to come to church and sing a couple of songs on Sunday. Brother, you, you need to take God home with you. Amen? And you need to recognize his presence there in everything you do and everything you say. And I'm telling you something. If Jesus Christ were sitting there and you wouldn't watch it on the TV, then you better turn it off now. If Jesus Christ were sitting there and you wouldn't let that come out of your mouth, you better not let it come out of your mouth now. Because I'm telling you something. He may not actually be there, but he is there. He is there. He hears everything you say and do. Second thing we need is the protection of the Lord. Listen to verse 1. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. In other words, the watchman is a picture of a sentry. It's a guard to watch over the city. While everybody else sleeps, he's watching for the enemy. And he's there to protect the city in the nighttime when it's in need of protection. He's looking for the enemy. I would urge you fathers and mothers to put on the spiritual armor of a Christian to pray the Lord's protection over your home and over your children, that you put on the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness, that you gird your loins with the uh, truth of God's word, that, 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 that you have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel, that you carry with you the sword of the word of God, which is able to, to vanquish the devil, to carry with you the shield of faith, to quench the fiery darts of Satan. Protect your home and include God protecting your home. Because if you do it without God, it's nothing but vanity. Vanity. Satan would love to lead your children astray. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, has a roaring lion stalking about, seeking whom he may devour. He'd love to eat you up and spit you out. And I've got news for you, dear friend. By yourself, you are no match for Satan. You are no match. You cannot fight this battle without the Lord. There's a great scripture. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 21, the Bible says that a famine fell on the land. So 1 Samuel chapter, uh, uh, 2 Samuel 21, a famine came. 
So King David goes before God and begins to pray and say, God, what is the problem here? Why are we not getting rain? Why, why is it not doing well? And God said, because you have broken Saul, King Saul before you, broke a 400-year covenant with the Gibeonites. And Saul went in and slaughtered some of the Gibeonites when he had made a deal with them and he broke his word. So you need to go to the Gibeonites and you need to go get this thing straight. So David goes to the Gibeonites and he says, we realize that Saul did you guys dirty. He stabbed you all in the back. What can we do to get this thing right? And, and the Bible says that the Gibeonites said, listen, we don't want your money. We don't want your silver. You go. What we do want, though, is seven grandsons of Saul. We want blood. We want the seven grandsons of Saul. So the Bible says that David, in a means to appease God and to appease and to make things right with the Gibeonites, gave them seven sons of Saul, grandsons of Saul, to be executed. And this is what the Bible says. And he delivered, this is 2 Samuel 21, 9. And he delivered them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and he, they hanged them on a hill before the Lord. And they fell all seven together and were put to death in the days of the harvest, in the first days, in the beginning of the barley harvest, which is in the springtime. Now listen to this. Look at this. And Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, took sackcloth and spread it for her upon the rock, from the beginning of the harvest until water dripped upon them out of the heavens and suffered neither the birds of the air to rest on them by day nor the beast of the field by night. And it was told David what Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, the concubine of Saul, had done. Wow. So you got a mom. Two of her sons have been executed. And in the springtime, she goes out where they've been executed on the hill, takes a burlap bag and lays it on a rock, and she stays there for six solid months till the rains come in the fall. What's she doing, Brother Sam? Well, she's keeping the birds of prey off of her sons, and she's keeping the animals of prey off of her sons at night. So here, 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 here's a picture. Birds of prey like buzzards love to attack bodies like that. And the first things they're going to go for are the eyes, the ears, and the mouth. And the animals that would come at night are those animals that would be jackals. So the picture you have here is this mother with a burlap sack, nothing but a burlap sack. She's there morning, noon, and night. And every time a buzzard thinks it's going to land on one of her sons, she's going, get away. Get away from my sons. Get off of them. Get away! And all during the night when the jackals come up and they're going to try to steal a bite or, or, or take off these dead bodies, she's going, get away! Get, get, get! And the picture is so clear. Oh, that we could use moms today that would say the buzzards that are trying to get my children to look at pornography, I'll stay up all night if I have to, but they're not getting my child's eyes. And that junk that they would love to put in my child's ears, they're not getting my child's ears. And the stuff that they would love to put in his mouth, like alcohol or tobacco or, or, or drugs, they're not getting my child's mouth. That's my child. I'll protect them if I have to stay up all night long. Well, you know, every now and then, every now and then, this is what we did. We said, uh, you broke the rules with your telephone. Give me the phone. Come on. Cough it up. You know, every now and then you need to take one of them phones, just drop it on the floor and go, ah, <laughs> solve that problem. See, my question is, who's paying for the telephone? Amen. That's a good question, isn't it? And, and the second thing is, if your child's drowning, aren't you willing to jump in the pool and save them? Aren't you willing to do whatever it costs to save them? Oh, I can't live without my phone. Oh, they can live without the phone. <laughs> Many of us live without a phone, amen. When I grew up, my, my house had one phone. It was in the kitchen. Brother, everybody heard your conversations. <laughs> they can live without a cell phone. I'll promise you. They can live without a computer, amen. Amen or old me. Amen or choke. 
But I'm telling you something, if you can't keep them off the pornography, what you need to do is you need to go over there and you need to pull the lifeline, which is the cord to the wall, and go, yank it, like a lawnmower cord. Yeah. <laughs> you start saving your children. Because I'm telling you something, Satan's after them. You can't protect them by yourself. You better pray a hedge of protection over them from Almighty God, that holy angels are watching over them. Always oh, was so. So I believe one of these days we'll stand before Holy God. And and see, you gripe about your daughter-in-law. My question is, how much did you pray for that daughter-in-law before they ever came along? When they were itsy bitsy babies, or even when they were in their mother's womb, we were already praying, going, "Oh God, I just pray that that you would be with Andrew's." bride to be i pray god that you protect her watch over her help her to grow up god would you put her in the right place and brother i'm telling you we got a gym amen heather Woo. every now and then she'll pray and we'll think revival's gonna break out around here <laughs> prayed for aaron's wife same way that's no guarantee that's no positive guarantee but i won't tell you this much it wasn't because we didn't try Our children need to be protected. And if mama and daddies aren't going to protect them, who's going to? You need to protect their eyes, their ears, what goes in their mouth. And then you got the presence of the Lord. This is great. Uh, these are like gifts. Listen to verse 3. Lo, children are in heritage of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward. The, the, the word lo is the word in the Greek language hene. And, and it basically means, hey, it's trying to get your attention. It's an elongated form of the word behold. So normally we would go, behold. But this is, behold. <laughs> so it's stretching. It really is drawing your attention that that baby that God gave you is a gift from the very hand of God. But that speaks volumes, doesn't it? Because one day I'm going to give an account for that baby. I, I, I've, I've got to answer to God whether or not I prayed over that baby, whether or not I, I, I showed that baby what true forgiveness was, whether I showed that baby what it was like to be a good husband. I've got to show that, 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 that to God what I did with that gift from the Lord. It, it's like a talent. I've got to give an account for him. One of the most valuable things that God can give you is a child, that you imprint your faith on his heart. And if you don't do it, let me tell you, we're one generation away from heathenism. One. One. It's not that you're trying to jam it down your throat, down their throat. You're sharing with them your joys. You share with them what you love. And if you love it enough, they're going to want to love it too. I love being a dad. One of the greatest joys of my life was being a father. Oh, I tell you what, we prayed and prayed and prayed. I didn't know if I was ever going to be a father, but it was such a joy when, when Karen goes, Woo-hoo, here we are, we're going to have a baby. I love being a father. And, and I, I, I just, I love doing stuff with Andrew and Aaron, and they did different things. Aaron wanted to play the guitar. I took guitar lessons. I was the worst guitar player you ever heard in your life. <laughs> you know, finally the guy started paying me money to, to, to just not take the lesson. But Aaron loved it, and, and it was something he enjoyed. He was in the praise band and play, played the, the keyboard and stuff. And, and, and Andrew came up and said, I want to take Taekwondo. I want to do the martial arts. And, Dad, would you do it with me? I said, yeah, I'll do it with you. Boy, I was dumb. <laughs> so I began to take the martial arts and, and take Taekwondo, and I enjoyed that because I got to meet some really, really neat people. But then, then we had the black belt testing, okay? And, and in black belt testing, they, they, they say, we're going to find out if you really want to be a black belt. So you've got to do, and I can't remember exactly, it's like three, three-minute sessions of sparring or fighting, you know, kicking and all that sort of business. So it, it, we were doing it at the same time. Andrew was doing his, I was doing mine, and, and you have to fight somebody that is of the same or a higher belt level than you. So I had to fight black belts doing this, and man, they were just over beating the tar out of me and, and having a punching bag. And see, here's what Andrew did, okay? Y'all can ask him about this young people these days because he was, he was sparring over there, and after about a minute, he went, hold on, lost my contact. <laughs> so him and his guy got to stop and look for, and everybody said, no, 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 y'all keep on fighting. So we're over here just sweating going, 
<laughs> about to have a heart attack, and he's over here crawling on his knees. They didn't make him make that time up either. I'll just tell you that. <laughs> I love being a dad. I love being a husband. I love my family. It is not a perfect family. We make mistakes. But it's my family. You need to treasure it, guys. You need to quit taking it for granted. Oh, ladies, please. Treasure that family that you got. Hold on to it. Pray for it. Realize you've got an enemy that wants to destroy you. And then, and then Psalm 127, verse 4 says, And as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that has a quiver full of them babies. Amen? They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. I just finished reading a book called The Heart of Everything That Is, The Untold Story of Red Cloud, who was a Sioux Native American chief. And, and it's really interesting because in this book, this biography, it, it says that if you were a Native American, you could find an arrow and you would know exactly what tribe that came from. Because they were meticulous with their distinct markings and decorations that this came from this tribe, from this family. And they really paid a lot of attention to the arrows that they would use as weapons. This is saying the same thing. Our children are our arrows. And they betray your family with their speech and their behavior. You can look at a child and know what's going on in the house. By how they speak and what they like and what their attitudes are. That's kind of scary, isn't it? That's why some of you don't have your children in Sunday school because you're scared to death what they're going to tell the Sunday school teacher <laughs> about what's going on at home. <laughs> I don't blame you either. The arrow was not meant to just be, it's meant for a target Psh, to bring glory and honor to God. That's the target. That's what I raised them for. They got to play baseball, they got to play basketball, they got to play the instruments, but the target was bring glory to God no matter what you do. The greatest sense of pride I ever had was Karen and I sometimes would say, we're on vacation. We got to go. We're going to some other church. And the boys would say, not us. You're dropping us off here. Because I wanted to surround them with as many Christian men and women that would imprint themselves on them as possible. So they were in Sunday school. They were in church. They were in RAs. They were in the youth group. Why? Because you jammed it down their throat. Not didn't jam anything down their throat. They wanted what we had. And they saw what we had and said, we want what they got. One day I will stand before God, and you will too, and we will give an account for the gift that God has placed in our hands. And, 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 and why some do some things? Why do you have some that turn out godly and some... I, don't ask me. I do not know. I do not know. We'll know the other side of heaven. But all I know is I'm going to give it the best shot because one day I will have to answer to God, did I pray with them? Did I share with them our love for Jesus? Did I take them to worship in God's house and not just send them? Did I live a life of faith for them to follow? And I believe, I believe that every minute, every second of investment that I put into those kids brings great dividends. So how's your family? How's your family? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Heavenly Father, we love you very much, and God, we thank you for this gift of a family. God, I can't do a thing in the world about yesterday or last year or last week, but God, from this day forward, I can change. I pray that will be our attitude today. God, you don't have to come to an altar. You can do it right where you're sitting. I pray, oh God, that men would say, I have not prayed for my children or over my children or for my children's mate. Today I start. 
Today I ask God to protect our home. Today is the day I begin to share God's word in our home with my kids. Today is the day I begin to live my faith by loving their mother and giving them a pattern of how they're to love their wife. God, change us, please. Protect us from Satan. And we will give you glory and honor for it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.